to have a pedagogical framework. A lot of adaptive systems have no pedagogical framework. You've got to have that. Second thing, you've got to have differentiated learning strategies, what we call dis uh, differentiated instructional models, because you have to provide those distinctions. The third one, you have to have a mechanism to assess those differentiated learning instruction and find which learning strategy is working for the student. Because you can't just leave them with five different learning strategies, so you have to have an intelligence in the system that is able to identify learning styles or strategy of the individual learner. And finally, you have to have intelligent system that is now providing them feedback in the real time how they can improve. And it's unlike systems which are uh, intelligent tutors where they will give you an exam and say, oh, if you didn't answer this, I'm going to send you here. If you didn't answer this, I'm going to send you there. And I talked to all of these mastery course kind of tutor tutors, intelligent tutors, it was very much based on uh, you know, how you click and where you go, and then creating this kind of tree structure in order to provide you feedback with, the, with what we call intelligent system or expert system in the old AI uh, thinking. Uh, so you could have in AI, artificial intelligence, you could have a, uh, you know, the case-based systems, you could have a neural network system, you could have a lot of different models, but what I've chosen is statistical inference because that's more applicable here based on the Markovian statistics. So I know all the jump probabilities and how people are jumping from one content to another and understand that. So these are four things which you must ask if you say someone says, oh, I have an adaptive system. Because people are claiming adaptive, they have auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. That's not adaptive. They're just providing different material in different shapes and forms. If you're just doing tutoring and providing some help after you do a test, that's not adaptive because, so what we do is that once we, they take a, a certain amount of diagnostic quiz, then we understand how, what concepts they are not mastered, and take them to those concepts and not give them answers. Most often these tutors will give you answer and say, ah, you're done, you got the right answer. That's not the way people learn. We have to make them go to those spaces and this is what, I'll show you how we do it in our model. So if you look at here, we are now moving away from these intelligent tutors and getting into what we call adaptive and what I'm focusing on called synaptic, which are the brain-based learning system. And I'm glad that Obama is going to put uh, lots of money into brain-based learning. And I think it will be great for all of us to understand about our brain. So now let's uh, look at brain. If I have to give you anatomy of the brain, it will take me three days to explain to you. <laughs> so I have a very simplified model. There are three parts of the brain. One is primary, which is motor cortex and all of these functions. Secondary, which allows you to memorization and some understanding and some cognitive learning. And the third one is oversimplification, and I apologize for that. The last one is tertiary, which is what we call executive function, the higher level learning processes. And if you look at in the, in the brain science, they also know that although we had created different regions that amygdala and, uh, and uh, hippocampus is responsible for memory and all of that, the different cortices, you know, uh, uh, neocortex, uh, the limbic cortex and all of that, a lot of jargons there. Well, what it means that at the end of the day in the brain there are neurons. And the neurons have to connect to other neurons to do a certain uh, task. So let me go forward with this and do some uh, uh, let me skip this for now. So if you look at in these neurons, what you see is that uh, these are very specialized cells in the brain and they have long tails and they get connected together to formulate a jumble of neurons which are connecting together. When I give you a particular task, essentially a few thousand neurons immediately activate and say, aha, what am I supposed to do? When I'm talking to you, as, as the sound is going through your ear, immediately the neurons are saying, what is he saying? He has an Indian accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I think these kinds of things are immediately created right away, and those are what we call is the functions created. I give an example of driving car. When you were first time driving car next to your dad and mom, it was a very difficult task. They keep telling you not to do something. But now when you go and you push your uh, car, you do not do any thinking. It's automated, primarily because certain number of neurons are allocated for driving. As soon as you sit in the car, they are activated. 
they will take over, they will do all the work without even you knowing. So you are driving, you are talking, <laughs> distracted driving, you are still getting to the place, God forbid if you get into accident, but this is what we call neurons taking over. And you can do multitasking. In some cases, oh, I won't go into the multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at, this is the pedagogical framework, so I looked at, you have to have a pedagogical framework. So I said, I'm going to come up with multimedia. Because most often, multimedia is uh, thought about as pedagogy. So if I do a lot of interactivity, they think the student will learn. Absolutely not correct. <coughs> Maybe few will learn, but what we understand, multimedia is not the answer. It's about how you put that multimedia in pedagogical framework. That's where we created five different learning strategies based on almost 300 learning theory models out there. So if you look at cognitive psychology, you look at learning theorists, you talk about uh, constructivism, you talk about cognitivism, you talk about behaviorism, uh, the old model of B.F. Skinner's and all that. All of that can be put together with five models, which are apprentice, and again, this is oversimplification, where apprentice is step-by-step -step learning. Incidental is done by example. Inductive, uh, incidental is done by real-life scenario. Induction is done by example. Deduction is done by learning by doing. And, uh, and discovery is learned by experiential learning. So these are the five models, so I take content all the multimedia that is provided to me and create five different learning strategies. And then I provide highly interactive interface so that to provide real-time intelligence, real-time feedback, and real-time creating a short course dynamically, and which is important, you have to have dynamically created content. Because you cannot create a static content and hope that it is going to match to the learning preferences of the individual learner. You have to have a dynamic content rendering, and this is what we do. As soon as you take a particular diagnostic quiz, then a dynamically generated course is created just for you, so it may not be the same for the next person sitting with you. And this is where individualization and personalization happen. So this is where I connect all these dots, so vision, audio, smell, taste, touch, these are the five uh, sensory organs that we all have. This is how we get information to the brain. Once you get there, then you have to have uh, 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 secondary cognition, which I'm enhancing by different kind of learning strategies, apprentice, incidental, inductive, deductive, and discovery, and then you get into a lot of interactivity like animation, simulation, real-time feedback, and all of that. That get, does get connected to memory system. So if you if you provide this kind of input, which really works with your brain structure or brain neurons, then it connects with your semantic memory, episodic memory, procedural memory inferential memory and inquiry-based memory. And this is where you retain. A knowledge is not good if you don't retain it. And this is what happens most often. You know, we take the course and, you know, there are three midterms and one final. I, I really work all night long. I give the exam. I get an A. Next day, the same question is asked. I say, I don't know. <laughs> this is what happens. Short-term memory. You keep everything in the short-term memory. And then you go to industry and say, I got, I got a degree from MIT, and they say, can you light a bulb with a piece of wire and a battery? They go, no, this is MIT graduates. <laughs> this was an experiment done after in, in, the, in the graduation ceremony at MIT. Few people came in with a wire and the battery and a bulb and to ask MIT students, can you light it up? Most of them could not. And I think this is where I say is that theoretical knowledge versus the knowledge that you learn by experiential learning is very different. And this is where we need to connect it with also social construction because ultimately you have to do discussion, dialogue, discourse, presentation, that which is I'm doing right now, and conferences. And this is where uh, you have to, when you go to industry and the workplace, you have to do all of that. And that's where you have to memorize and you have to retain stuff. So these are the four things, media, models, interactivity, and social construction. Four dimensional learning. And that's why uh, my, uh, the system is now called 4DL height. Four dimensional learning, hypermedia instruction, and teaching environment. So 4DL height, and if you look at multimedia, and it is important part of the delivery mechanism, but it has to match with your learning strategy that enhances your sensory perception so more neurons are getting fired. Once more neurons are activated, then you have to provide learning strategies, so now you can synthesize that. So now you understand about cognitive process which are in the brain, and it has to connect to your cognitive process, otherwise multimedia is information overload. 
doesn't help. I gave you lots of you know multimedia. I don't know why the hell I'm looking at all these videos and anything. I don't know. <laughs> oh. I have to give that in a particular way, a pathway, learning pathway, so I understand that's where cognition happens. And then you go into intelligent feedback. So once I do something, I say, did I do it right? Wait, wait, don't tell me, you know, all that. So you want to see whether you got it right. So that's where you do a particular quiz, diagnostic quiz, which has no grading involved in it. And based on that, you go back again and see, oh, I did not get this, so let me understand it again. But not giving them answer. Once you do that, then you see the synaptic network is getting more and more formulated. Once the synaptic network is formulated, next time the same task is given to you, you can do it fine. No problems at all. And the finally, when you learn something, I say, hey, hold on, hold on, let me tell you what I learned. You know, the kids do it all the time. When they learn something new, they want to tell. They'll come to the fair and say, let me, let me tell you what I learned. <laughs> this is where social construction comes. Now you want to share that information with your peers and say, hey, I learned something, and then you go on the discussion board. This is where the synaptic strengthening takes place. Because when you tell someone else what you learned, you are strengthening your network. That's why teaching is the best way to learn. When you teach someone some concept, you really learn a lot because you're strengthening your neural network. So this is where we started with the neural network and getting into strengthening of it. And then you will not forget. If you teach something to someone else, you will not forget what you taught. But before you teach, you have to have understanding of what you're teaching. <laughs> so if you go forward, I already talked about that. I just wanted to take a little